Boeing B-17 Flying Fortress Design and Development The Boeing B-17 Flying Fortress was one of the two standard heavy bombers used by the United States prior to arrival of the Boeing B-29 Super Fortress in 1944. The other was the Consolidated B-24. On August 8, 1934, the U.S. Army Air Corps tendered a proposal for a large multi-engine bomber to replace the Martin B-10. The Air Corps was looking for a bomber capable of reinforcing air forces in Hawaii, Panama, and Alaska. Requirements were for it to carry a useful bomb load at an altitude of 10,000 feet for 10 hours, with a top speed of at least 200 miles per hour, a range of 2,000 miles, and a speed of 250 miles per hour were desired but not required. A prototype financed entirely by Boeing went from design board to flight test in less than 12 months. On July 28, 1935, the four-engine plane took off from Boeing Field in South Seattle on its first flight. Rolling out of the Boeing hangar, it was known simply as the Model 299. Seattle Times reporter Richard Smith dubbed the new plane with its many machine gun mounts, the Flying Fortress, a name that Boeing quickly adopted and trademarked. Competition for a contract to build 200 bombers was to be decided by a fly-off between Boeing's design, the Douglas DB-1, and the Martin Model 146 at Wilbur Wright Field in Dayton, Ohio. The Boeing entry outperformed both competitors and exceeded performance specifications. The Air Corps designated the plane as the B-17. It was a low-wing monoplane that combined aerodynamic features of the XB-15 giant bomber, still in the design stage, and the Model 247 transport. The B-17 was the first Boeing military aircraft with a flight deck instead of an open cockpit. It was armed with bombs and 530 caliber machine guns mounted in clear blisters. On October 30, 1935, Air Corps test pilot Major Ployer Peter Hill and Boeing employee Les Tower took the Model 299 on a second evaluation flight. The crew forgot to disengage the gust locks, which locked control surfaces in place while the aircraft was parked on the ground. After takeoff, the aircraft entered a steep climb, stalled, nosed over, and crashed, killing Hill and Tower. Other observers survived with injuries. Variants Daunted by the crash and the high cost of the plane, the Army High Command canceled acquisition plans. However, the Air Corps had been impressed by the prototype's performance, and on January 17, 1936, through a legal loophole, ordered 13 YB-17s, designated Y-1B-17 after November 1936, to denote its special F-1 funding for service testing. The YB-17 incorporated a number of significant changes from the Model 299, including more powerful Wright R-1820-39 Cyclone engines. Opposition faded, and in late 1937, 10 more aircraft designated B-17B, were ordered to equip two bombardier groups, one on each U.S. coast, improved with larger flaps and rudder, and a well-framed 10-panel plexiglass nose. The B-17Bs were delivered in five small batches from July 1939 to March 1940. In July 1940, an order for 512 B-17s was issued, but at the same time of the attack on Pearl Harbor in December 1941, fewer than 200 were in service. The aircraft went through several alterations in each of its design stages and variants. Of the 13 YB-17s ordered for service testing, 12 were used by the 2nd Bomb Group of Langley Field, Virginia, to develop heavy bombing techniques, and one was used for flight testing by the Material Division at Wright Field, Ohio, while models A through D were designed defensively, the large-tailed B-17E was the first model primarily focused on offensive warfare. The B-17E was an extensive revision of the Model 299 design. The fuselage was extended by 10 feet, a much larger rear fuselage, vertical tail fin, rudder, and horizontal stabilizer were added, and a gunner's position was added in the new tail. 
Two experimental versions of the B-17 were flown under different designations, the XB-38 and the YB-40. The XB-38 was an engine testbed for Allison V-1710 liquid-cooled engines, should the right engines normally used on the B-17 become unavailable. The only prototype, XB-38, to fly crashed on its ninth flight and the type was abandoned. The YB-40 was a heavily armed defensive modification of the standard B-17 used to escort bomber formations before the North American P-51 Mustang, an effective long-range fighter, became available. By the time the definitive B-17G appeared, the number of guns had been increased from 7 to 13, the designs of the gun stations were finalized, and other adjustments were completed. The B-17G was the final version of the Flying Fortress, incorporating all changes made to its predecessor, the B-17F, and in total, 8,680 were built, the last by Lockheed, on July 28, 1945. World War II Planning The B-17 served in almost every theater of World War II, but was used mostly by the U.S. 8th Air Force, based in England, to bombard German targets. The first missions were in daylight hours to improve accuracy, but this strategy plus a lack of adequate fighter coverage resulted in very heavy losses of aircraft and crew. As refinements progressed, along with better pilot training and tactics, the B-17 became a formidable weapon in the Allied war against Germany. There was no easy way to hit Germany, as a cross-channel invasion of Europe was still years away. The British had been bombing from the air, but heavy losses forced them to switch to nighttime area bombing, greatly reducing effectiveness. The Americans, on the other hand, were proponents of daylight precision bombing, using their state-of-the-art and top-secret Norton bombsite. They also believed they had an aircraft which could fit its way in and out of the target area, unescorted, and return home safely. In the years following World War I, the United States was heavily influenced by Italian air power theorist Giulio Douay, who called for heavy investment in a force of bombers to fly over the front lines, destroy an enemy's infrastructure, and break their will to fight. In theory, in the words of British Prime Minister Stanley Baldwin, the bomber will always get through. The Americans believed the B-17 with the Norden bombsite could be that bomber. The bombsite was developed and fielded in great secrecy during the 1930s. It consisted of a gyroscopically stabilized telescopic site coupled to an electromechanical computer into which the bombardier fed inputs for altitude, atmospheric conditions, airspeed, ground speed, and drift. During the bomb run, the site was slave to the automatic pilot to guide the aircraft to the precise release point in the hands of a skilled bombardier. The Norton was remarkably accurate. The different strategies of the American and British bomber commands were organized at the Casablanca Conference in January 1943. The resulting combined bomber offensive weakened the Wehrmacht, destroyed German morale, and established air superiority through Operation Point Blank's destruction of German fighter strength in preparation for a ground offensive, the U.S. bombers attacked by day, with British operations chiefly against industrial cities by night. With a renewed focus in power, the Allies finally achieved the air supremacy needed over Normandy for the D-Day landings in June 1944. Early Use Before the intensive American bombing of Europe, the B-17 saw use by the British Royal Air Force, RAF, and by the U.S. in the Pacific against Japan. The RAF had entered World War II with no heavy bomber of its own in service. The biggest available were long-range medium bombers such as Vickers Wellington, which could carry up to 4,500 pounds of bombs, while the Short Sterling and Handley Page Halifax became its primary bombers by 1941. In early 1940, the RAF entered into an agreement with the U.S. Army Air Corps to acquire 20 B-17Cs, which were given the service name Fortress One. By September 1941, the RAF had lost eight B-17Cs in combat 
and had experienced numerous mechanical problems. Bomber Command abandoned daylight raids using the Fortress 1 because of the aircraft's poor performance. The experience showed both the RAF and US that the B-17C was not ready for combat and that improved defenses, larger bomb loads, and more accurate bombing methods were required. However, the U.S. continued using the B-17 as a day bomber, despite misgivings by the RAF that attempts by daylight bombing would be ineffective. As use by Bomber Command had been curtailed, the RAF transferred its remaining Fortress 1 aircraft to Coastal Command for use as a long-range maritime patrol aircraft instead. Soon, however, thousands of B-17s were brought to England for use by the U.S. One of the first to fly the treacherous northern air route from America was My Gal Sal. On June 27, 1942, horrendous weather conditions forced this early E-model B-17 to make an emergency landing on a Greenland ice cap. The entire crew survived the 10-day ordeal by repairing the aircraft's radio and transmitting an SOS, which resulted in their rescue. The plane remained on the ice for more than 50 years before being recovered and restored. In the Pacific by 1941, the Far East Air Force, FEAF, based at Clark Field in the Philippines, had 35 B-17s, with the War Department eventually planning to raise that to 165. When the FEAF received word of the attack on Pearl Harbor, General Louis H. Brereton sent his bombers and fighters on various patrol missions to prevent them from being caught on the ground. Brereton planned B-17 raids on Japanese airfields in Formosa in accordance with Rainbow Five war plan directives, but this was overruled by General Douglas MacArthur. The B-17's greatest success in the Pacific was in the Battle of the Bismarck Sea in March 1943. There. B-17 sank or damaged several Japanese transport ships. At the peak, 168 B-17 bombers were in the Pacific Theater in September 1942, but already in mid-1942, General Arnold had decided that the B-17 was unsuitable for the kind of operations required in the Pacific and made plans to replace all of the B-17s in the theater with B-24s and later B-29s as soon as they became available. Although the conversion was not complete until mid-1943, B-17 combat operations in the Pacific Theater came to an end after little over a year. American Operations in Europe The first U.S. B-17 raid in Europe took place on August 17, 1942 when 12 planes attacked the railroad marshalling yards in Rouen, France. American bomber numbers continued to build in Europe and attacks and losses began to build up. While the US 15th Air Force also had B-17s, the most famous group to fly them during the war was the US 8th Air Force based out of England. B-17s flown by the 8th saw some of the fiercest combat of the war. As the Americans flew deeper into Europe, the missions became deadlier. One of the worst days for the B-17 and its crewmen was the second raid on ball-bearing production in Schweinfurt, Germany, in October 14, 1943. Losses were so heavy on the mission, it became known as Black Thursday. The B-17, for all its armor and firepower, was simply unable to continue to fly unescorted against swarms of German fighter aircraft and their sophisticated air defense system. Clearly, something had to be done because the bomber was not getting through. But help soon arrived when the North American P-51 Mustang began to reach the beleaguered 8th Air Force in large enough numbers to make a difference. The B-17s finally had a fighter which could escort them in and out of Germany, and they began to overwhelm German defenses and industry. The escort fighters reduced the loss rate to below 7%, with a total of 247 B-17s lost in 3,500 sorties. By September 1944, 27 of the 42 bomb groups of the 8th Air Force and 6 of the 21 groups of the 15th Air Force used B-17s. Losses to flak continued to take a high toll of heavy bombers through 1944. 
But the war in Europe was being won by the Allies, and by April 27, 1945, two days after the last heavy bombing mission in Europe, the rate of aircraft loss was so low that replacement aircraft were no longer arriving and the number of bombers per bomb group was reduced. The combined bomber offensive was effectively complete. The B-17 was noted for its ability to absorb battle damage, still reach its target, and bring its crew home safely. Wally Hoffman, a B-17 pilot with the 8th Air Force during World War II, said the plane can be cut and slashed almost to pieces by enemy fire and bring its crew home. After examining wrecked B-17s and B-24s, Luftwaffe officers discovered that on average, it took about 20 hits with 20 millimeter shells fired from the rear to bring them down. Pilots of average ability hit the bombers with only about 2% of the rounds they fired. So to obtain 20 hits, the average pilot had to fire 1,020 millimeter rounds at a bomber. During World War II, approximately 40 B-17s were captured and refurbished by Germany after crash landing or being forced down, with about a dozen put back into the air. Given German Balkenkrates national markings on their wings and fuselage sides, and Hackenkrate swastika tail fin flashes, the captured B-17s were used to determine the B-17s vulnerabilities and to train German interceptor pilots in attack tactics. A total of 12,726 of Boeing's long-range bombers were built by the end of the war. Much of this production occurred at Boeing Plant 2 in Seattle, 6,981, with the best built under license by Lockheed, 2,750 under the name Vega, and Douglas, 2,995. The B-17 dropped more bombs than any other U.S. aircraft in World War II. Of approximately 1.5 million tons of bombs dropped on Nazi Germany and its occupied territories by U.S. aircraft, over 640,000 tons were dropped from B-17s. At one time, more than 1,000 B-17s could be assembled for mass combat missions. Following the end of World War II, the B-17 was quickly phased out of use as a bomber, and the Army Air Forces retired most of its fleet. Many new B-17Gs were being flown directly to long-term storage, sold, or even scrapped. Today, fewer than 100 B-17 airframes exist, and fewer are still in airworthy condition. If you like these types of videos, subscribe to our channel and get notification when we release new episodes. For more interesting military history content, check out our video library.